This is Chick Hearn, voice of the Los Angeles Lakers. Another capacity crowd at the fabulous Forum. The fast break is to West. West Gordon. Jerry West going about whenever he wants to. Back to Wilt underneath, slammed up. Oh, my. Oh, my. Little Gale looks like he's back home, and he is at the fabulous Forum. He wound it up in a blaze of glory, Captain Elgin Baylor. If you would have asked me before the season started, could that ever be done by any team, I would have thought that you were crazy. In the game of basketball, few teams have a history, a tradition, a story that's the Los Angeles Lakers. The players, the coaches, the championships. To all of that history, one Laker team stands out. The 1971-72 team brought Los Angeles its first title and has long been cited as one of the NBA's best. What's often forgotten is that this was an unlikely champion whose long and largely ill-fated journey changed the franchise, the city, and the game. Although the Lakers have been at the center of Southern California's basketball landscape for over half a century, their roots can be found nearly 2,000 miles away in the heartland of our nation's upper Midwest, Minneapolis. Led by superstar center George Mikan, the Minneapolis Lakers established the league's first dynasty, winning five titles between 1949 and 1954. But when bad knees and the introduction of 24-second shot clock forced the lumbering Mikan to hang up his sneakers, the Minneapolis Lakers dynasty came to an end. The Lakers rebuilt with a group of talented young players, including 1959 Rookie of the Year, Elgin Baylor. But despite an exciting new brand of basketball, these new look Lakers failed to endear themselves to Minnesotans. So with attendance dwindling, the ambitious new owner, Bob Short, looked west. Catch the lightning in the bottle that the Dodgers had. Los Angeles was a baseball town, and, and really a football town, too. It was not a basketball town. The Dodgers had come in a few years earlier, met at the airport by tens of thousands of people. Everybody loved them. The Lakers drove in through San Bernardino at midnight. <laughs> mm. It really was the beginning of expansion for the NBA. It did take professional basketball from being really a primarily East Coast game and moved it west. Game night, the Los Angeles Memorial Sports Arena. The waiting is over. The West Coast teams could have been in Siberia. Pro basketball? What? What the hell's a Laker? And what are they doing here? So it was crucial for the national coast-to-coast -coast success of the NBA that the Lakers succeeded. The cornerstone of L.A.'s new professional basketball franchise was a Minneapolis holdover. Six-foot-five-inch forward, the captain, Elgin Baylor. This is the magnet that draws the fans into the new Los Angeles sports arena, now that big league professional basketball has reached the West Coast. People came out to the sports arena when no one knew the NBA. And people just deified Elgin. Every game, it was Magic Johnson and Dr. J all rolled up in one, Michael Jordan, I mean, he was tremendous. Elgin Baylor, regarded by many as the best basketeer in the world. I just believed that, you know, I was going to be successful. A fabulous one-on-one -on -one player. Nobody could stop him. He could shoot from the outside. He could score inside. Elgin shot the greatest array of shots of anyone in professional basketball. He was so ahead of his time, you didn't see moves like Elgin Baylor's. He was remarkable. He could float through the air, he could soar, he could create. I never really thought about who was going to guard me. You know, his guard didn't play. Without Elgin Baylor, there is no rapid building of the Laker franchise here in Los Angeles. To complement Baylor's all-around game, 
the Lakers used the number two pick in the 1960 NBA draft to select rangy West Virginian guard Jerry West, a two-time All-American and an Olympic gold medalist. West arrived in L.A. with a fierce determination to establish a winning tradition in Los Angeles. When he came in, you could see that, you know, just right off that he was going to be a terrific player. He was about 6'3", but with long arms and high shoulders. He would go to his right, take one hard dribble, and use that dribble to kind of bounce up and shoot his jump shot. He was a terrific defensive player. This is maybe the greatest game I've ever seen Jerry West play defensively, Lynn. He filled passing lanes, he would steal balls. If you were playing against Jerry West, before you threw a pass, you had to stop and think, where is Jerry? Can I throw this pass? By his movement, he made every other player move the way he wanted them to. Jerry West was a genius. As fierce a competitor as imaginable, he worked very hard. It wasn't a game I ever played in I didn't want to win. Not one. Even the exhibition game. Six, five, four, three, two, two. It's over! Jerry West is the most valuable player in the ball game. Basketball was not just a profession for him, it was a way of life. This is the Mar Vista Playground in West Los Angeles, California. Working out with the youngsters is Jerry West, Los Angeles Lakers red hot sharpshooter from West Virginia. Hi, Jerry, how are you? Hello, Bob, how are you doing? Getting an extra work on? Well, a little bit. Is it just a coincidence that you live across the street from this basketball court? It gives me a, a chance to, to get over here and work out sometimes when I feel that I need it, and uh, it's very convenient for me. When you talk about players and you say, oh, their personal statistics don't matter, he cares about the team, that was really true about Jerry West. The ability to lead, to inspire, to set a level of responsibility, he gave his best. The Lakers were quick to establish themselves as the class of the NBA's Western Conference. Elgin Baylor's 35 points and nearly 20 rebounds per game helped lead Los Angeles to the playoffs in just their first season. A year later, with sophomore Jerry West upping his scoring average to nearly 31 per game to complement Baylor's career-high 38, the Lakers made a spectacular run to the finals, only to lose in a heartbreaking seven-game series to the Boston Celtics. It was the first of numerous finals defeats for the Lakers at the hands of the Eastern Conference power, a team in the midst of winning an unprecedented 11 NBA titles in 13 years. The architect of the Celtics dynasty was a round-ball pioneer. Brett Auerbach, who's the coach of the Celtics, was the first NBA coach who understood what the 24-second shot clock meant. He understood that you could up-tempo the game. To make the fast-break style of play an organized team effort instead of an unplanned rush down the court requires not only constant drilling in the fundamentals, but also practice as a team unit. So they would just run and run and run and run and keep the pressure on the other teams and test the other team's will to win. The focal point of Auerbach's master plan, both defensive stopper and igniter of the fast break, was formidable center Bill Russell. Rebounding is the key to the fast break, and Bill Russell is a tremendous asset in getting possession of the ball for the Celtics. Notice how he protects the ball until he can pass off for the fast break. An uncanny team sense of timing, essential to this quick scoring technique. Bill Russell was always there, and uh, he was someone who was the foundation of a team. Tremendous in terms of wiping out defensive mistakes that they might make. But they predicated their defense on being really aggressive and driving people toward him to either create a bad pass or him maybe blocking a shot. Russell understood that playing defense and being sort of a wheel horse on offense was more important than scoring points. There's a picture of him that I can still see to this day with his hands on his hip at midcourt. He had a regal look, okay? He looked like he was the, you know, the king of this court. The only thing he cared about was winning, and he damn sure did a lot of that. While the Bill Russell-led Celtics were redefining basketball excellence, the Lakers, along with John Wooden's UCLA Bruins, were creating a basketball culture in Southern California. Eager to capitalize on the game's newfound popularity in Los Angeles, an eccentric Canadian businessman purchased the Lakers in 1965. Chick Hearn used to say about Jack Kent Cooke is the only man he ever met that would like to die in his own arms. Cooke himself was a man of great sartorial splendor who was fiercely competitive. 
an adventurous opportunist. He was a flamboyant guy with a very snotty sounding accent. The owner of the Los Angeles Lakers and the Los Angeles Kings, Jack Kent Cook. Chick, it was a nip and tuck battle and I nearly had a couple of heart attacks towards the end, but it was all worth it. Professional sports, you gotta have a little showmanship. And Jack Kent Cook had that. The showman Cook saw his Lakers as headliners worthy of top billing at the Los Angeles Sports Arena. Went to the Coliseum Commission. Says, I have the Lakers, I have brought in a National Hockey League franchise, the Kings, I want preferential dates at the sports arena. Coliseum Commission said, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. They laughed at him. Next thing I knew, we were on the end of a shovel in Englewood, breaking ground for the fabulous form. And by the way, uh, Chick and Lynn, I want you on the air to call it the Fabulous Forum. Chick Hearn, along with Lynn Shackelford, and along with 17,000 fans, we are at the Fabulous Forum. He's the type of guy that set up his own reality and had the money to do it. Cook changed the colors to what he called Forum Blue, which is purple, and gold. <laughs> and gold. I don't want you to say purple, so call it Forum Blue. You had to have a big man in those days to win in the NBA, but the Lakers never had the big man. So the Laker owner, Jack Kent Cook, decided, I want to win a championship, I have to have a big man. Jack Kent Cook mentioned to me, what about Wilt, would you want Wilt? I said, are you kidding me? You know, absolutely. I feel very, very happy that I am being traded to a team that I believe may stand a chance to be, go down the record as one of the best teams in basketball ever. If you ever talk to Jack and Cook, you don't out-talk Jack and Cook, and he talked me into uh, playing with the Los Angeles Lakers. Playing his old nemesis, Bill Russell. Wilt had led the Philadelphia team to the championship a couple of years earlier. Having West and having Baylor wasn't enough. And it wasn't until they pulled off the trade to bring Chamberlain there that they were going to do it now. We felt that, you know, we had the missing piece with uh, Chamberlain. That's Jack Ken Cook in action. This could be the added ingredient that we needed. It was a fantastic squad. And then to have Wilt come and join the team, what more could you ask for? As incredible an athlete as has ever played. Wilt Chamberlain had long been in the center of the basketball world spotlight. From his days as a schoolboy standout in Philadelphia, to headlining for the Harlem Globetrotters, to his triumphant 1967 NBA title with the 76ers, becoming the lone big man to vanquish Bill Russell on his way to that title. He would now take center stage in Hollywood. I knew that I was now coming to a team that was loaded with superstars of their own. Elgin Bella and Jerry West, uh, to name the two most consummate pros of our time. So now they had the three superstars, West, Baylor, Wilt Chamberlain. Now they're going to win it. It's like, this is going to be a piece of cake. Hooray for Hollywood, man. Here it comes. Get the gold rings ready. With the big three of hard-nosed coach Butch Van Redekoff leading the way, L.A. cruised in the 1968-69 season. After dispatching San Francisco and Atlanta in the opening two rounds of the playoffs, the Lakers prepared for a much-anticipated rematch with the rival Celtics. In spite of Boston's recent mastery over L.A. in the finals, this Lakers squad was confident. Not only did they now have a match for Russell with the Goliath Chamberlain in the middle, but the Celtics' firm grip on the NBA looked to be slipping. The Celtics had finished fourth in their division in the East, and nobody thought they'd go anywhere in the playoffs. It's true that the Celtics weren't the dominant team that they had been. It was fully expected that this year would be the year for the Lakers. The big series starts in Los Angeles with the Lakers versus Boston for the championship and Chamberlain versus Russell again. The 1969 finals tipped off in Los Angeles. Each team defended its home court through the first six games of the series, setting up yet another Game 7 versus Boston. With the decisive contest being played on the forum floor, the Lakers had a golden opportunity to exercise the demons of playoffs past. Despite the home court advantage, the Lakers found themselves trailing by 17 early in the fourth quarter. With Los Angeles buckling under the weight of heavy expectations, all eyes turned to their center. The Lakers now uh, will be going to Will Chamberlain. 
Will Chamberlain driving on Russell, and you may see a lot of that now. The last five times they've had a chance to be world champions, the Celtics have defeated them. Chamberlain hurt his leg on the play. Chamberlain can't move, Chris. He's down there holding that knee. He really twisted that knee on that last rebound. This could be a big factor in the closing minutes of this game. Will Chamberlain brought here by Jack Kent Cook in hopes of bringing the first title in nine years to Los Angeles. Disappointments thus far for Jack Kent Cook, the owner. Will signals to the coach he's got to come out, and he is killing it. Then Brennikoff is furious. And now Will Chamberlain comes over to the bench. Mel Counts is going to come in for Will Chamberlain as Will Chamberlain rests that right knee. Van Bredikov did not believe him. Unless you're dying, nobody should be coming out of the game at this particular time. Van Bredikov felt that Chamberlain was a big load and not a team player. Called him the load with that inflection. There had always been questions about his heart. The thinking was that he just didn't want to be there when they lost. Van Bredikov thought he was a punk, that he was checking out. Then comes Mel Counts for Will Chamberlain. Van Bredikov put Mel Counts in instead. It was a seven-foot jump shooter who hit a couple of shots. And suddenly the game is close and close. 3-21 remaining in the championship game. The Celtics having a lead of 17, cut down to three. Mel Counts. Now the Lakers within one point of the lead with about three to go. I'm sitting on the bench at that time. And Will says to me, tell the man I'm ready to go back in the game. Van Bredikoff told me, we don't need him. Havlicek lost him by a single point. Knocked away, but Nelson gets it. The Celtics are doing everything they can. He didn't put Will back in. We lost. Many of the Los Angeles fans are beginning to leave the forum. And time has run out, and the Boston Celtics have done it again. With Chamberlain on the bench, the Lakers once again lost in heartbreaking fashion to the Celtics. It was L.A.'s sixth finals defeat at the hands of its arch nemesis. For Jerry West, it was another brilliant season that ended in bitter disappointment. His nearly 40 points per game average in the finals earned him playoff MVP honors, but that was little consolation for one of the game's fiercest competitors. I want to say that Jerry West was... Absolutely fantastic. That was one of the greatest exhibitions I ever saw in my life. We clearly had a better team, and we didn't win. I looked at those games like life and death, and um, I just felt terrible about it. Anytime he could not win, he took it personally. And if he didn't play well, he took it personally. After that brutal seventh game loss at the Forum, here's the great Jerry West with tears in his eyes, and the hurt that he felt. It was extremely frustrating for me. I, I, don't, I, I could, can't answer that for other players, but it's something that I never forgot. I haven't forgotten it to this day, even. That was probably the most disappointing year. Heartbreaking, you know, because there are a couple of times we just, just knew we, you know, that we had it. It was just disgust. We had another opportunity to beat them. Didn't happen. I played at a level that was hard to believe that I could play at that level. And uh, it still wasn't good enough. Frankly, it got to the point where I didn't want to play. The summer of 1969 marked a new day in the NBA. Bill Russell's retirement brought an end to the Celtics reign, and with it, a sense of optimism to the rest of the league. The door was wide open for the Lakers, who under new coach Joe Mullaney again earned a trip to the finals in 1970. Despite the absence of the Celtics, the Lakers were denied again, this time by a team destined to make their own mark on NBA lore. Although the Lakers pushed New York to a Game 7, Willis Reed's heroics and Walt Frazier's stellar performance dealt the Lakers their seventh finals loss in nine seasons. Age and injuries began to take their toll on the Lakers during the 1970-71 season. 36-year-old Elgin Baylor missed all but two regular season games with a ruptured Achilles, and Jerry West was lost for the playoffs with a knee injury. With two of the big three sidelined, 
the shorthanded Lakers were dominated in the 71 conference finals by the upstart Milwaukee Bucks. By the time Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Oscar Robinson celebrated their 1971 NBA championship, the Lakers' window of opportunity was all but closed. Jack Ken Cook fired Joe Mullaney after just two seasons on the bench. Set to introduce their third coach in four seasons, the Lakers were a team in transition, if not disarray. There was little reason to believe the new man was the cure for what ailed the Lakers. The new coach of the Los Angeles Lakers, William Walton Sharp. Here he comes. For Bill Sharman, a former foe who built his coaching reputation in the ABA, the task was a formidable one. Do you feel, looking at the talent on the Laker team, its age and its recent injuries, that this is or can be a winning basketball team, a championship team? Definitely. Naturally, there's a lot of yes, hands, and buts, but if they can stay healthy to begin with, I think we have a very strong chance of uh, winning the world's championship. He's inheriting a bunch of old guys who don't believe in themselves anymore, who view him with suspicion because he played his whole career, his all-star career, won many, many championships with the Celtics. Big man for the Celtics is Bill Sharman. Watch him. Bill is the deadliest shot in the game from any point within 20 feet of the basket and the most accurate foul shooter in professional history. I had great admiration for the Celtic teams. Uh, I didn't like Green very well because we'd seen so much of it. My experience playing against them was uh, based out of respect, but also didn't frankly care for him very much because they'd beaten us so much. Everybody really remembered him as a player with Boston and how he had fit in with that team. Boston 59 to 57, faced by the shooting of Bill Sharman. He was a Hall of Fame backcourt player, Bob Cousy's backcourt partner with the Celtics before Russell got there, when well, the Celtics were pretty good, and then after Russell got there, when, when the Celtics became the best team in the league. Bob Cousy, number 14, has it. Now Sharma, that soft one-hander, hits again. He carried himself, as really good athletes often did, with a great deal of self-confidence. Bill Sharma came in with credentials. And to be a successful coach in the NBA, you have to have credentials. You have to have leverage. More than just being able to bench a player. You couldn't BS him because he could say, I've been there, I've won championships, I know what it requires to win in all sorts of different environments, and there are certain fundamental truths that I know about, and you probably don't. And Sharman came in with those credentials, and Jack Kent Cook gave him that power and influence. His track record as a player, winning a lot, I think kind of set the tone for us as a team. But we had a lot of obstacles to overcome. If you look at this team, it was a team that was older. We weren't in the prime of our career. None of us were. Injuries had made a big impact on Elton. They'd made an impact on me. I didn't know what was going to do for us. You have a team that doesn't mesh a lot of personalities that don't mesh. You have Jerry West, who's really disillusioned, downhearted. You have Elgin Baylor coming off a very serious injury. He has Will Chamberlain really over the hill. I've seen so many players that they've said are too old or over the hill that have just performed super. Will had 40 to 50 individual records. But his resume was a little short in championships. He only had one championship. Wilt wanted another championship, and he knew time was running out. Sharman sensed that. Same with Jerry West. He didn't have a championship. Time was running out. And so Bill Sharman put all of this together, and then he put together a training camp in Hawaii that was rigorous. All the players said it was the hardest training camp they'd ever gone through. We had been to Hawaii before, but the atmosphere wasn't the same. This th the atmosphere this year was, I felt, a little bit different. It was, it was all seriousness. Bill Sharman was a work ethic coach, and so his training camps were very hard. They, were, they weren't things that were easy. Jerry, what's your opinion of your new coach, Bill Sharman? Well, Tom, uh, he is a stickler for conditioning, and uh, I say we have had about four nightly workouts so far, and I'm kind of sore right now. I should make that clear then. If the pass is not there, if somebody else is open, or if you got a shot before you complete the play, take it. I'm anxious to talk to the players and see them play more 
and then make up my mind. But right now, I would certainly hope and feel that we will be a running club. Charmin needed a fit team in order to implement a new system in L.A., one that his old Celtics had used as a cornerstone of their great success. Well, I went back and I think I was trying to fast break. That was trying to push with and we were successful. The long pass is a major part of the fast break, and an offensive man can often score with an easy layup. Bill Sharman demonstrates the long pass. So that's what I was trying to do, the best I could. He really stresses running. We want to run a lot this year, and we have the players that can run some, I think, and uh, that is the way he wants to play. Having him here was uh, kind of a breath of fresh air. In order for his running style to take hold, Sharman knew he needed his two stars on board. He first approached Jerry West. When I got the culture job, he was the first one I went to. And he couldn't be more cooperative. He wanted me to play a different kind of role and uh, in terms of being a ball handler and you know making plays for a team. Jerry had typically been the shooting guard on the team. And all of a sudden you're saying to him, you're going to become the point guard. When people look at players, they always say, well, can they change spots? Because you get credit a lot of times for, oh, he could really score the ball. But also, more importantly, I wanted to play a team game. He sacrificed a lot, you know, just like work. Bill Sharman knew as a former pro player and, and a coach for many, many years that the best way to win is in an open court game and you get a lot of easy baskets, fast break baskets, and if you've got the right talent, you can do it. He had the right talent, and he knew that. He had the game's greatest rebounder ever in Wilt Chamberlain. Traditionally, when you had Wilt on your team, you didn't fast break all that much because you wanted to wait for Wilt to come down, set up in the post, throw the ball to Wilt, and then run your offense off Wilt. And Charmin, who, bringing his Celtic uh, history with him, said, no, what we want Wilt to do is rebound the ball, and throw it out to the guards, and we'll all run down the floor and score a basket by layups and so forth, which is the way we always did it in Boston. He had to play different. He still was capable of scoring a lot of points, but he was more capable of affecting the game and rebounding and blocking shots. He had to change Chamberlain's way of thinking. I gave up my scoring uh, to do other things. I always felt like doing whatever to make the team win was the thing to do. He wanted to win as badly as anyone else, and we all wanted to win. And anything that we could do at that stage of our career, because late in our career, we were going to try to do to try to win, and most people didn't give us much of a chance. Wilt may have been content to adjust his role on the court, but it was Sharman's radical approach to game day that looked to pose a different kind of problem. A day of the game practice. This was unheard of never been done before in the NBA. Players didn't want to do that. <laughs> you know, I mean, players were used to sleeping until 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon and then coming in and playing. And so everybody agreed to do it with the exception of Wilt Chamberlain. Wilt said that he was an insomniac and he rarely got to sleep until 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. The Big Dipper didn't like to shoot around. Wilt Chamberlain was notorious for not liking to practice, or maybe sleeping through practice and not showing up. Wilt was uh, very set in his ways. Charmin says, in a very low-key way, I respect Wilt's problems with insomnia, but this is a team, and in these morning shoot-arounds that I want to have, it requires that everybody who's going to play that night be there. It makes them realize that I'm thinking about the game, and it gets them thinking about the game, to go over some of what the other team's going to do. Wilt said, look it, I'm going to the arena once. What do you want me to do? The shoot-around or the game? So you can tell the man that I'll either go to the shoot-around or I'll go to the game. He has his pick. <laughs> when he said this, of course, there was a lot of ha, ha, ha. This is really, really going to be fun because, you know, Wilt's just not going to show up. So I called him, so I'd like to take him to lunch. So anyhow, we went to a cafe and we talked about it. He said, Bill, I don't like getting up early in the morning, but he said, I'll try it. And if I think it'll help the team or me, I'll go along with it. The fact that he and Wilt made this work was a, a big factor in making the team coalesce. I'm going to tell you something. 
bad as it looks, it didn't miss by that much. You just seen me make two in a row. <laughs> no, I had to set for a fair. There you go. Woo! I'm going to five hours. Huh? I just made the last three of them. I don't care. This is the one I'm talking about for five hours. Get it up! Get it up! For him to jump up and say, you know, this is something I'll do without any, you know, conversation about it, that was a huge part of our success that year. But as the 71 72 season began, the Lakers failed to fire on all cylinders. We won our first four day in the pool season, then we lost a couple, and um, we kind of went downhill because we weren't running as much as I wanted to. The problem is Bill. Elgin had lost a step or two, was really having problems. All of a sudden, it really affected the way I played. I couldn't run, jump, or rebound like I, you know, like I could. Gee, what the heck is wrong? You could tell he couldn't run as fast or he didn't have the quickness that he had. Elgin had had a couple of knee surgeries and the knees were gone. His bad wheels limited his game to such a point that he became a liability on offense rather than an asset. It was really evident that Elgin was, was not the Elgin that we knew. I was really, 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 really struggling. But thinking in my mind, okay, fine, I'll go back and I'll be the same player. I wasn't. It just wasn't there. We were six and three, and then Bill Sharman decided to make a lineup change. I said, Elgin, I'm not going to start soon for a while, see what happens. Because I think maybe if you don't play as much, you might be faster and play a little bit better and have more fun. We sat down and we talked about it. I said, you know, that's, that's you know, too much. Can't do it. Nothing there could be done. I wasn't the same player, and you had to face reality. He came to me and says, Bill, you know what? I've had a great career. And he says, I think I'm just going to call it class. He wound it up in a blaze of glory, an average career-wise 27 points a game. The third greatest score in the history of the game. At only six feet five, the fourth greatest rebounder in the history of the game. Ten times an all-star. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Captain Elgin Baylor. The one thing I miss most of it, you know, that uh, I wasn't on a championship team. The team has the uh, personnel to win a championship this year. Too bad I just can't be around the rest of the season to see it all through. The day he retired, was a sad day for me. It almost seemed like a death in the family, to be honest with you. He was, um, everything he had contributed to this franchise, his enormous ability, all of a sudden he's gone. There's no knock on the great Elgin Baylor because he may have been as good as there ever was. But he was ready to retire. And when he did leave, his void was filled by a young guy who gave us some of the things that we needed and made it a little easier for me maybe to do my job and a little bit easier for Jerry West and Gil Goodrich to do their jobs. Bill Sharman had a young player, Jim McMillan, who he needed to get into the lineup and who could really fit in well with this team and didn't need the ball. Jim is a man in motion, a master of the Sharman technique. Coach Sharman is the type of coach who emphasized movement because of my movement. It can sometimes be contagious and get the other four men in motion, which creates a lot of things for everybody. His general 
younger legs and so forth made their overall performance in the fast breaking on defense much better. Jim McMillan rarely gets burned on defense. And once he gets the ball and goes on offense, he's tough to stop. One of the things that he contributed to the whole dynamic of the team was that he practiced hard. And now they would go at each other and practice. And the second team was very competitive. That second unit would compete. And not only compete, we beat the starters. Our practices became very good, and uh, we, we took it to the next level. Immediately, the team picked up speed. From that point on, the team just took off. November the 5th, 1971. Jim McMillan has just replaced the retired Elgin Baylor, and Big Will Chamberlain has just been named captain of the Laker team. With young Jim McMillan in the starting lineup, Coach Sharma could at last implement his full-court offense, using Will Chamberlain as the catalyst for the fast break. In their first game after Baylor's retirement, the Lakers beat Baltimore 110-106. The aggressive Will Chamberlain pulls down 26 rebounds. Gail Goodrich has his second consecutive 30-point production. Sharman knew what it would take for the Lakers to win a championship. And for him, that meant playing the same up-tempo kind of game that the Celtics had been so successful with. But in order to do that, he had to get Chamberlain to play like Russell. And all the Lauren, I was surprised that he picked them up and seemed like he liked them. I was now the defensive hub of this team, and that was what my job was all about, getting the ball and playing defense and giving the ball to these guys. This team looked like they'd been doing this throughout its history. And Wilt was often not even in the offense. He'd still be back in the defensive zone as the guys were running down, and Goodrich would be shooting a 15-foot pull-up jump shot. The Lakers now have their longest win streak of the year at five games. I think getting our running game going was the biggest factor in the ball game. West to the fast break to Goodrich. Another assist for Jerry West. He leads the league, averaging nine a game. Win number 10 in a row, 106-99. Jerry West played different, because I've seen Jerry play for his average 30, 40 points. But now, he was more of a playmaker. We put the ball in Jerry's hands. Where it should have been and where, where it belonged. West front court, down the middle. Right side to Goodrich, he's got it underneath, spin shot, good, he's gone. Not that Jerry didn't have the ball before, he did, but I think he, he made him more aware of what Jim McMillan could bring in terms of offense, what I could bring in terms of offense. Jerry was, a, was very, very smart so that he could realize that we had a team Inherent in him, somehow, was that ability to look at a team and see what they needed to do. When you see a team play together, I think the one thing that you can see, you can see a team that's mentally coordinated. Forget physically, we were mentally coordinated. I mean, we were plugged in. Goodreach fires an 18-footer. Hill Goodreach, another 18-footer. The Lakers by seven. Will Chamberlain wears number 13. And he stars in his 13th straight victory as the Lakers win with ease. In Los Angeles Lakers achieving their 15th consecutive victory. There was no greater beneficiary of West's passing powers than the Lakers' diminutive guard, Gail Goodrich. Goodrich kind of gets lost in the shuffle there. you got to find a place when you come to a team as to how you can contribute and what you do, what role you're going to play. He fit in perfectly, and Gale was a scoring machine. Gail Goodrich, as far as you know, was a star of the team, he was averaging 25 points a game. He could shoot that thing. He could get, he could manufacture offense. Shorter than me, he wasn't as quick as I was, and he didn't jump as high as I did. I don't know how this guy kept scoring all those points on me. I could just throw a ball, and I knew he was going to be there. I mean, I wouldn't even have to look. We had a mental connection. Rounding out the starting five were McMillan and a rugged, happy Hairston. The duo combined for nearly 32 points and 20 rebounds per game. Over to McMillan from 20. Good shot. I don't know of a better sophomore in the league, really. Clock is running down and out. The ball game's over. So the Lakers win their 18th game in a row. This incredible show wasn't limited to the starting five. Newcomer John Q. Trapp came off the bench to spark two of the victory. Big Lee Roy Ellis back with the Lakers. And number 12, Pat Wiley, seemed to be everywhere at once. And when the ball got to a third new Laker, Flynn Robinson, it was instant points. We had a bench of no names. 
but there's no names. Played hard every day in practice. I just can't say enough good things about our players. With the Lakers flourishing in Charmin's system, the team approached the NBA's record of 20 consecutive victories, a mark set just the previous season by their Western Conference rivals, the Milwaukee Bucks. It wasn't until you got up into the mid-teens that all of a sudden it began to get interesting. You get to 17, 18, 19 wins, now people are saying, like, wow, can they ever lose? If the Los Angeles Lakers tonight defeat the Atlanta Hawks, they will have won 21 consecutive games. The Lakers in 57 seconds, 57 seconds have outscored them 6 to nothing to take the lead. The Los Angeles Lakers are the greatest winning team in the history of basketball for consecutive wins. On behalf of the players, we really appreciate your support, and we're going to do our best to bring the championship here this year. Most thought the win streak might end at 21, but it continued, and the attendance grew. Packed houses greeted them at home as well as on the road. The Lakers were now a national sensation. Every opponent wanted to be the one to end the streak. They just kept on winning and winning and winning. Winning and winning and winning. Getting better and better and better. Boy, they grew together and grew together and grew together. We would all sit around and say, why is this team so great when the last few years they haven't been great? What is Charmin doing? Really, the essence that began in training camp. They really became disciples of Charmin. And whatever he said was now golden. Winning really cures a lot of other problems. Make me awful happy. People start to see this team as a championship team, the first one maybe for the Los Angeles area. This team became so confident, we started looking at the NBA schedule. I see the toughest game coming on January 9th against Milwaukee. Every game they won, we're sitting there and we're saying, okay, please win. Not only do they win 20, they win another 13 in a row after that. We were pulling for them not to lose a game because we wanted to let them know that we were still the team to beat. The Bucks had an extraordinary record going at that point, too. That added a great deal of flavor to that Sunday afternoon game. If anybody was keen and primed to stop this nonsense of 33 in a row, was the Milwaukee Bucks come to our house? January 9th, 1972. The Lakers travel to Milwaukee to face the world champion Bucks and their avid fans. The Lakers had already gone the entire month of November and December undefeated, and they certainly didn't want their streak to end here. The Lakers could do nothing right, while Milwaukee did nothing wrong. The swarming Bucks were just too much, this time anyway. It was inevitable that the amazing win streak would eventually be stopped, and appropriately. It was the world champion who ended it with style. I'm glad it was Milwaukee because they were the team that was capable of beating us. And also gave us some relief. We're like, wow, we finally now can go back to being sort of a normal, good basketball team. No surprise when you look back on it, but a shock after watching the team win 33 in a row. 33 is, you know, stop thinking about it, in an 82-game season, that's not too far from half the season going, going undefeated. The impossibility of it defied all sane calculation. You play 82 games and you win 33 in a row? I mean, that's incredible. It's unheard of. Will it be broken? I don't know. That 33 is not going to be tested. I think records are made to be broken, but there's a couple records that, that are not going to be broken. I don't think. I think this is one of them. If we had to do it all over again, I think we would have beaten Milwaukee. I think we'd have probably maybe won 45 or 50 games in a row. You know what I'm saying? But you know, when you're caught up in something, you say enough is enough. Though the streak may have ended, the Lakers continue to dominate. Will Chamberlain, on his way to an 11th rebounding title, set historic milestones for both points and rebounds. Jerry West led the league in assists at nearly 10 per game. His 25.8 point per game average was second on the team to crafty left-hander Gail Goodrich, who led the way with a career-high 25.9. The Lakers, league leaders in nearly every category, finished the regular season with a record 69 wins, including a 63-point drubbing of their in-state rival, the Warriors. The Lakers' statistics may have been impressive in their own right, but they were only a prelude to the NBA's second season, the playoffs. The Lakers went into the playoffs having set a regular season record with 69 wins. Nobody had ever done that before. 
Their first opponent was the Chicago Bulls, who had won 57 games during the regular season. No slouch. They blew them out in four straight. And then they played the Milwaukee Bucks, who had won 63 games that year in regular season. Tremendous anticipation because every knowledgeable NBA fan knew that the Lakers, to get back into the NBA Finals, we're going to have to go through the defending world champion Bucks. There's talk of a Milwaukee Bucks dynasty. Uh, can that be cracked? Well, I think so. We have Will Chamberlain, Jerry West. I could go on and on. Hap Harrison, right down. The, we have the material that and the depth that I think if we can put the pieces together that we can beat Milwaukee. This is the series that everybody's been waiting for, and of course the rematch from the January 9th game. The Bucks still felt they were the Bucks. We are here, we're the champs, and we're going to shut you down. We knew that they were, quote, the second best team. We did have the better team, and we'd proven it all year long. I don't think that uh, anybody on the team felt that, that we couldn't beat them. We felt we should win. And then, of course, you throw out the matchups, Oscar versus Jerry, Wilt versus Kareem. I mean, this is Hollywood script. Now the long-awaited showdown was a reality. The fabulous form was jammed with fans dreaming of a championship. But what they saw was a nightmare. And when it was all over, Milwaukee had held the Lakers to their lowest point total ever, 72. Panic? Yeah, the, <laughs> I would say that would be an understatement. It was that feeling. Here we go again. Oh, my God. Is this going to happen again? Whoa. What's going on here? What did that 33-game streak really mean? Was that just a fluke? It was an awful game. I mean, they looked like a junior high school team. We were atrocious. I don't know if anyone played well for us. We didn't do anything right. I wouldn't be surprised after setting an NBA regular season record for wins that if the Boo Birds might have even come out. Despite all their success, the Lakers had that uh, rather dubious legacy of always losing when it counted. No. I've got the city of Los Angeles worried. The prevailing opinion was still that this is still the Lakers, these are still the glitzy Hollywood team that's going to fold when the pressure gets tight. We have to contain you know, each individual to a certain extent, but we'll have to go out there and put a team, and that's what uh, is on my mind, is just what we can do best uh, to stop their team. The second game, is probably one of the greatest games in the history of NBA playoffs. It was a phenomenal game. Jamar against Will, batted away by Will. Chamberlain takes the ball. This particular game was a, a, a clash of wills. Will Chamberlain getting instruction from Sharman and Jones how to play Jabbar, and he's driving Jabbar crazy. Though the Bucks shot a remarkable 61% from the floor, the Lakers managed to preserve a narrow victory on the strength of Jim McMillan's career-high 42 points and the customary late-game heroics of Mr. Clutch, Jerry West. Here we are playing one of the best games we've ever played in our lives, and we lose. That invincibility that we had built up inside of ourselves got shattered. Tonight, uh, we have five or six guys scoring-wise that contribute a lot in different places. The team that can play nearly the way that they want to play is going to be the winner in this series. What about your team morale? Well, I think if you're in this locker room tonight, it's pretty good, don't you think? After trading games, the Lakers took control of the series by winning game five. They returned to Milwaukee with a trip to the finals on the line. Sensing the magnitude of the moment and understanding the precarious nature of a possible game seven, the veteran Lakers captain chose this moment to stand before his team. We'll call the team meeting. Will call the team meeting. He made probably the only inspirational speech that he's ever made. We all huddled up and he made a comparison to himself and Bill Russell. He said, listen, I've always been the best center in the league, but I never had the right teammates. I was better than Russell, but Russell had the best teammates and Russell won. Now, this young kid, Jabbar, is the best center in the league. We, the Lakers, had a better supporting cast than what Kareem had. Let's get this thing over with right now. The sooner the better. Don't give them any more hope. Wilt knew that uh, 
that he was the guy on the team that we looked up to, that uh, he was a guy that was going to help us win. The confidence that this was the last game <laughs> for the series. Game six was a close affair through three quarters when Wilt again stepped to the forefront, squaring off against his young rival, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Kareem and Wilt hated each other in those days because Kareem was the young lion coming up to take all of Wilt's records and Wilt wasn't going to let it happen. He presented to me for the first time a guy that I felt that I really needed some help to guard. Watching Wilt and Kareem duel one-on-one -on -one was phenomenal. It was fun to watch those guys back in against each other. Two of the greatest ever, just head-to-head. -head. In the fourth quarter, Wilt just took over the game. I had to go to the boards harder, and I had to try to run harder and do some, do some things that were a little bit different and see how he would handle me defensively. Wilt came to play. He just beat up. Well, said, I am going to make sure that we win. I blocked three of his guy hooks in a, in a row and had to, a score of about eight or ten points in, in two or two or three minutes to give us a chance to win uh, the game. Wilt's there, puts it up, and in, Chamberlain, basket counts, foul. Puts it up, Chamberlain blocks it, Allen puts it up, Chamberlain blocks it. Wilt backing in, underneath, finger roll, slam dunk. The Lakers look like they got a cinch win. Three seconds, two seconds, one second, the game's over, the Lakers have won. They beat Milwaukee four out of six. Chamberlain had made good on his word, leading the Lakers past the defending champion Bucks and landing Los Angeles in the finals once more. It was the eighth finals appearance of the Lakers' 12-year tenure in Los Angeles. The people of Los Angeles could almost taste the ultimate victory. But standing in the way were the Eastern Conference champions, New York Knickerbockers. The Bucks were the best team, had been the best team, used to be the best team. The Knicks were considered to be the most intelligent team in the history of basketball. That was one of the teams that was really a team. They played so well together and they had a lot of good players. The old cliche, they play the game the way it's supposed to be played. They play great defense. They move the ball around. It was brain power versus talent, so it was a natural uh, confrontation. The Lakers were a heavy favorite because they just beaten Milwaukee. They got Jerry West and Gail Goodrich. They got the home court advantage. And what do they do? They stink up the place in game one again. Give the ball over to Frazier. Frazier shoots it good. New York got what they need. They're down the middle of Frazier. Beats everybody. Play it up and in. Clyde, as they call him in New York, came to play. The Knicks beat him worse than the Bucks did in, the, in their first game. So once again, you know, same old story. The Lakers are, have gotten to the finals, and once again, they're going to fail. We lost that first game. Uh, by a lot, and we weren't even in the ball game. Going down big in that first game, it just sort of inspired us. That was a wake-up call for us. This was another opportunity that we could blow if they didn't get their act together. There was gloom and doom, but there wasn't gloom and doom among the people who actually played the game. We were going to need some good fortune to win, but uh, we still felt that if we played well, uh, our rebounding would, would make a difference. From game two on, Wilt took on a new role. Just a force on defense and set picks and rebounded like crazy and threw great outlet passes. The Lakers even the series on the strength of Chamberlain's 23 points to go along with his 24 rebounds. Back on level ground, it was a relaxed team that headed east. So they get to New York. I was really struck by how relaxed Jerry was. I got no sense that he felt undue pressure after all these years of not making it, or undue pressure because he felt he wasn't playing as well as he might have in his best days. Despite an uncharacteristically poor shooting percentage, West, along with the dominant Chamberlain, led the Lakers to road wins in games three and four. He did everything else he had to do above and beyond, even though he was struggling shooting the ball in that series. He did everything else he had to do to make sure we completed the task. The Lakers rode a three-game winning streak back home to the fabulous forum. I'm Chick Hearn along with Lynn Shackleford, and tonight the Los Angeles Lakers have a chance to do something that they have never done in their history, and that is to win the World Championship of Basketball. There's a swell, like an ocean wave coming in. There's a momentum that it's just like your time to win. Our team simply was going to find a way to beat anybody who was put in front of us. We were not going to be denied.
the momentum and the emotion in that fifth game with the Lakers was there was a swell that West and Goodrich and Chamberlain were not going to lose this game. They were going to win this game on their home floor, and they were going to win it that day. Chamberlain comes underneath. Reverse slam dunk. Pass him deep to Wilt. He's there. He's got it. Put it up and in. The Lakers are winning it right now with outside shooting. 16 foot jumper. Good. McMillan taking him apart. Down the middle. Scoop shot on the way. Nice play. An underhand scoop shot from four feet. The crowd is going for Cirk in anticipation of what they hope will be the final game. I've never heard anything like this in Los Angeles. So they just keep the momentum going. Then they will fly the World Championship banner at the fabulous point. The season has seven seconds left. And the Los Angeles Lakers are the World Champions of Basketball. The Lakers conclude their basketball season with a record of 81 victories and only 16 defeats. If you would have asked me before the season started, could that ever be done by any team, I would have thought that you were crazy. We ran into the locker room and the champagne was flowing. I'd enjoy to win that first one. It was all a special feeling that finally we were able to win when maybe we didn't think that age would allow us to do that. There was as much relief as there was just pure innocent joy. But that frustration was over. Finally exercised all the demons in terms of winning a championship. Jerry, it's been a long time coming. We've been together through all those years, through all those miserable seventh games that didn't come to fruition, but tonight it's here. How do you feel? I, I, I really don't know. I, probably tomorrow I'll feel a lot better, but I, I tell you, I, I, I'm absolutely at a loss for words. Everybody in Los Angeles wanted Jerry West to win a championship, and, and he finally got it. And even the media guys, I think, who are supposed to not be partial, were excited. There are people you really feel good for when things, good things happen to them, and, and West is one of the people you had to feel good for. To see him you know, win his championship and, and not to have to worry about the rest of his life, that, <laughs> that all he could remember is getting beat by the Celtics. Finally got that monkey off his back, you know, and, and I think the Lakers finally got that monkey off his back. The thing that I'm most proud of, obviously, was the fact that uh, we were able to win for the city of Los Angeles, and more importantly, with people that I love playing with, and, and for a coach that um, is one of the greatest people I've ever been around in my life. Jerry was such a hard worker and such a great player, and he deserved to you know, be on a championship team. Where's Elgin Baylor? I saw him here before. Is he still here? See if you can find Elgin. Stand up there. I think maybe Elgin left. I don't see him, but did Elgin leave? Former Laker great Elgin Baylor made his way in, extended his congratulations, and made his way out of this very hot and jam-packed locker room. The thing that has bothered me the most in my life is that my great friend and incredible player, Elgin, wasn't there to participate in the actual winning of it. It was just tremendous, you know, to see it. I was happy for the team to win a championship. I mean, that's the ultimate goal. What can you say about this team after they won the championship? The very next year, we lose to the Knicks, you know, in the finals, and then that was it. A team that was built to win a championship never. It worked. And unfortunately, the guys were too old for it to work any much longer, so it didn't become a dynasty. But it certainly was one brief shining moment. If you compare, just take that one year, there's no team in the NBA that's had a better year. Each one of us were champions in our own way. This was a team, the Lakers in 72, that led the league in scoring, led the league in rebounds, led the league in assists, led the league in point differential, had the 33-game winning streak, scored over 100 points, 81 out of the 82 times, in 15 playoff games, the Lakers won 12 of 15. Put that against some of the great teams in the NBA. That's flying. Was this the best team of all time? Uh, and that will be debated and debated and debated. It has to be. I mean, why wouldn't it be? It won 33 straight. Absolutely the greatest team of all time. And I was part of it. <laughs> 
that was in what 1972 this is 2010 so that's what 38 years ago and we're still talking about it the team sort of glows in my mind there's this long shot taken from one end of the floor as the lakers have already turned they're coming at you well, there's an expanse of golden floor and that's kind of my image of that team that was a the team sort of touched by gold they had this serendipitous winning streak played just great and they did it in a way they'd never done before.